cover um, some of the highlights of this chapter. So again, um, make sure you read it. You cover all the all the other items. I'm just going to kind of take you through a few of the more difficult things. Um, you can read them, that type of thing. So um, there are really three things this chapter covers about is cash, short-term investments, and accounts receivable. Um, this one is the most difficult one for students to master the uh, bad debts part of accounts receivable. Uh, some students have some trouble with short-term investments. I think mainly it's uh, just due to kind of trying to hurry and not paying a whole lot of attention. But anyway, so just practice it. You'll get that one. Cash isn't uh, quite so hard again, but if you don't practice it, you'll probably have some issues with it. But cash will come quickly. Short-term investments uh, next. And the accounts receivable, um, again, you might um, want to work through several of those problems. So cash is pretty important. We've all heard cash is king. So um, basically, uh, Sometimes your entire job might be focused around cash management, making sure you have enough cash on hand and that you don't have too much cash on hand. And um, if you do, you might move it over to short-term investments. Um, so anyway, so that's this to work. Um, so we talked about this uh, financial assets. We we do term these three things financial assets because we're going to find out cash is obviously cash, short-term investments, marketable securities. So those are securities in the stock market. So you generally don't call a privately held company a marketable security. So um, in the Quincy area, we have uh, Nap Hides, we have um, Neiman Foods, we have uh, Curlins, we have some, and if you had your own family, those are not publicly traded companies. So we wouldn't call those marketable because you can't sell them quickly. So marketable securities would be uh, if you decided to uh, buy some shares of stock off the stock market of Apple today, you could sell it 10 minutes later. Um, that's how marketable they are. And finally, receivables, accounts receivable from customers. Um, you're going to find out later that you can actually sell accounts receivable to uh, factoring um, companies, so they'll buy your accounts receivable. We generally think of really poor receivables being sold to collection agencies, but there are businesses that will buy um, better, higher quality accounts receivables. Okay, and so you can kind of read through that. But this is um, a pretty important slide here. Um, the how you value them on your balance sheet. So notice these are all assets. Hopefully, if you hopefully you knew that. If not, you probably need to go back and, and study what an asset is. But cash is kept on the as its face amount. Cash and cash equivalents. We'll learn that certain things we consider cash, even though they're not. So a ten dollar bill is valued at a ten dollar bill. That seems pretty simplistic, but sometimes. It does get more complicated when you have foreign currency and other things. But uh, basically, face amount means a $10 bill is a $10 bill. Uh, marketable securities, remember there's a market for it. And if I needed to find out how much Apple stock was selling for, I could go out on the stock market and figure out how much Apple stock is selling for just by looking it up. And everyone that looks it up would get the same answer. So we tend to value those at market. So we call it mark to market. So we move those to market value at year end. This causes a little distortion on the balance sheet because if you value them at market at December 31st and something happens to the stock market on January 1st, um, your company could either gain a lot or lose a lot of value in one day from what you reported it at. But we do report those at fair market value. Um, and at receivables, we value those at net realizable value. What net realizable value means is the net amount you're going to realize from collections. So if I um, sold 100 t-shirts to 100 people and at $10 each, so I have $1,000 in accounts receivable, what's the chances of all of them paying me? And the answer is uh, probably pretty slim. Um, so maybe one or two people won't pay me. Uh, so of my... 100 t-shirts at $10 each, so $1,000. Maybe I've decided two people won't pay me. So my net realizable value is the $980 that I think I'm going to realize from my receivables. Okay, remember, the definition of an asset 
is current or future benefit. And so if I have $1,000 of receivables, but I don't feel I'm going to collect all that money, then um, that's not an asset. So I have to value them at the current or future benefit, which is the net realizable value. Okay, so what is cash? And remember we call it cash and cash equivalents types things. But cash includes checks, money orders, traveler's checks, bank card sales. A Visa and MasterCard are considered um, cash. The reason is, is that the um, Walmart, for instance, will get their cash from Visa. Now Visa will charge them a fee, and this book doesn't go into that fee. But um, if the person doesn't pay, it's Visa or MasterCard that loses out, not the business. So that's why we consider them cash, uh, because we will get the cash for that. Okay, cash equivalents. Um, cash equivalents, so if we, if we talked about what is cash, I think we would all say a checking account is cash. And then I would throw in... Okay, is an interest-bearing checking account, is that cash or an investment? Um, and we would have to decide that. Once, if we decided it was cash, um, what if I said a money market account, which is similar to an interest-bearing checking account, but there's probably a little more uh, limitations on the number of checks. Is that cash or an investment? And at some point, we would keep arguing about it, and at some point, somebody would stop and say, okay, I don't really care what we call cash. Let's just be consistent. So that's what happens with cash equivalents is basically say they are very safe. They have a very stable market value, and they, and they mature within uh, 90 days of the date of acquisition. So some examples are money market funds, U.S. Treasury bills. Remember, we have bills, bonds, and notes, and bills are the short one and high-grade commercial paper. And commercial paper is uh, where the large companies loan each money other money, basically usually on a week to two weeks they pay it back. So, um, so for instance, take five large companies. And large companies from day to day might have excess cash or be short cash just because of the timing of the collection of their accounts receivable and the payment of their bills. So. A company with excess cash may loan another company um, who has is short cash for that day money, and they might loan them money for five days, let's say, because then they know their bills are going to come due and they need the cash back. So anyway, uh, a market has formed for this, and you have an intermediary that serves as the go-between. So if I have some excess cash, I'll go to the intermediary, intermediary and say I have... Um, $10 million to loan and another company may say I, I need to borrow $2 million and they lend it to each other at very low interest rates. So that's a commercial paper. Again, it's very short term, usually a week or two. Um, restricted cash. Restricted cash is simply cash. So on a balance sheet I have cash, but let's, let's take a, a situation that is maybe your own situation. If you have cash in a, in a checking account, that's yours, and it's yours to spend however you want. But what if you have another cash that your grandparents gave you when you were born, and they are co-signers on this checking account, and you cannot spend it except for on a college education. So basically that's your cash, but it can only be used for certain purposes. So we, on a balance sheet, remember, the owners of the company are shareholders and they don't work for the company. Um, however, um, the company may say, all right, or a shareholder may wonder why we have a lot of cash sitting around and the answer is it's restricted for some purpose. So I may be planning an expansion, so I'm saving up cash to pay the contractor and so I'm letting cash build up. So basically it's, it's to prevent a lot of questions. So I just put two lines for cash cash and then restricted cash and the total is all our cash but it just serves as a notice to an investor why um, we're not using that cash for any other purposes. Lines of credit. Uh, lines of credit um, is you've gone to a bank and you set up a, a loan and that loan you may never use, you may use part of it and again uh, let's take most colleges and universities. Uh, colleges and universities are a good example because they have an influx of cash 
at the end of August and at the end of December. Okay, so what if I have a lot of cash around, but I pay my employees every two weeks? And so you're going to find out that mid-August, I owe my employees money, but my cash is not coming in until the end of August. So what I might do is I send, sign, set up a line of credit, sometimes called a letter of credit with a bank, and it is an amount that I can borrow up to the max of. So I'll, let's say I set a line of credit up for a million dollars, and so if that payroll is $200,000, I will only borrow $200,000 on the line of credit, um, but it just I can just set it up ahead of time and quickly borrow the amount, and I only pay interest on the amount I borrow. So you usually set it up for more than you need. Um, that way you don't have to go back in there for anything. So that's a line of credit. Um, cash management, and cash management I said before, um, basically this could be your entire job, but what the, some things that you want to manage for cash is make sure it's recorded correctly, but you want to make sure that you, you just don't have cash sitting around, so you want to prevent theft or fraud, etc. That I've got enough cash to pay for bills, so I set up a line of credit. If I'm like a college or university that might have um, times where I'm low on cash just simply because it's not coming in yet, uh, but businesses also pay their bills, let's say, I'm making this up, at the end of the month, but most of their cash comes in at the beginning of the month, and so they may have to borrow a little bit of money until uh, the cash comes in. And we don't want a whole lot of cash sitting around because cash sitting around provides no revenue. Okay, so you can read through that. Um, these I don't want to make light of internal control, but you can read internal control. So make sure that you separate handling from cash from accounting records because basically I could uh, take some cash and post it against uh, the accounting records differently as if it not if it didn't come in. So think about church collections. If you had the same person taking the collection plate as recording the collection. So the person who took the collection plate could steal the cash out of the collection plate and never record it and nobody would be the wiser. So what do we do? Uh, we make sure two people count the cash at the collection plate and one person uh, then records the cash amount and the other person would take the cash to the bank. So they would have to work together in order to steal cash. So I want to separate handling cash from records. Um, people say you're an accountant, you have access to a lot of cash, that's actually false. If you're in accounting, you touch no cash. You keep track of it, somebody else handles the cash. Um, make sure that you have cash budgets so you can see if you're uh, short. And most of this you can apply uh, to your daily lives of you need a cash budget. And a control listing of cash is, again, let's take the collection plates. Um, if two people count it, we could list the checks and who they came in from and the amount of cash on hand, and we both sign it. Um, the, the piece of paper goes to the person in charge of bookkeeping and then the cash goes to the bank. So we have a piece of paper going to accounting that lists all the cash and then once the bank deposit comes back the accountant can see that got in the bank. But again, the person making the records or making the entries to the individual accounts uh, doesn't have access to cash. Okay, um, again, you can read through these. All of these are very, very important, and your book has them, and you will be asked questions on them. So if you have any questions on them, please ask me, but um, since you guys can read, um, I'll let you read them. Okay, um, sometimes what happens if you um, are short the amount, so if you think about running a register. What if my cash sales on the register totaled $4,500, but yet... I counted the cash and only $44.85. So probably um, those of us who've handled cash in our lives, I'm, I'm sure we have miscounted cash back a time and probably don't even know that we did. And maybe even the person who received the money didn't know that we did. So if you think about going to a, a ball game or something and going to the concession stands when it's really busy, I'm pretty sure two bills can be stuck together, etc. So what happens? Well, remember our accounting records have to agree to the amount of cash that are, is on hand. So in this case, I get cash down. So remember, I counted that there's only 44.85, dollars 
instead of 4,500. So I need to credit cash, cash is an asset, credit it to get it down. And then I put a, a, an account cash over in short. Um, at the end of the period, this cash over in short is either a revenue or expense account. Um, and depending on whether I have more debits or more credits and hopefully if it's large, you have basically look into something because you have a problem. But most of the time it washes out near zero. And that's why we don't put expense or revenue on it because we don't, we put both the overages and shortages in it and at year end, it's going to either net out, we made a little money. And again, you don't want to steal money from people. Um, you will tend to not get those people back and you don't want to um, lose money from yourself. So you generally would want this balance zero, but um, you know, it's not going to be. We all make mistakes. Okay, so we're going to talk about a bank reconciliation. Um, hopefully you reconcile your own bank um, statement and you know that the amount on the bank statement and your records nowadays are getting closer and closer because of online. But when things were done through the mail, um, you always had differences. And most of these differences are due to timing difference. So for instance, if uh, you go and you deposit an amount in your bank account today, or even if your um, online salary deposit goes in today, and you go home and in the mail is your bank statement, you can guess that maybe that hasn't gone on there, got on there yet just because of the timing difference. So outstanding checks or stack checks that I wrote that the person hasn't cashed them yet and got them to the bank. A deposit in transit is one that is still in transit. So it's still on its way to the bank, but I've got the bank statement in the mail. Okay, so here's an example of a bank statement. You can look at that on your PowerPoint slide that's kind of close up. Um, some other reconciling items of service charges. So sometimes banks charge service charges, um, and sometimes I don't know how much those service charges are because they charge it based on an average balance in the account or the number of checks or something, and I really don't know that until I get the bank statement. Okay. Not sufficient funds checks. Not sufficient funds check are when I um, check the bounces. So, for instance, I get a check from a person, I deposit it in my bank account, I write it in my check statement, I think I have the money, and then it goes to the person's uh, bank that wrote it, that wrote the bad debt, there's no cash in there, so we say it bounces. So the bank's not going to cover that, so they take it out of my account because it was a phony check. We'll deal with those in just a second. Okay, so sometimes uh, checking accounts pay interest, and we have other things, so we're just going to go through this. And there's a lot of steps here, but I'll show you that I kind of um, do this, but I don't make a list of steps. Okay, so you have this over here. Okay, and what we I do is I put balance per bank. I set it up like this, and you're going to see it's exactly like their setup. You can actually go to the next one. Okay, it's exactly like their setup, but they do it on top. So this is balance per bank statement. This is this half, and this is this half. The reason I set it up like this is I never know how many lines I'm going to need. And instead of doing one thing at a time and saying, okay, I'm going to go through this list and look for all the additions, go then go through this list and look for all the deductions, then go through this list and go look for the, all of the additions here, I just simply plug them in as I go. Okay, so I'm going to read through and I'm going to show you where they go. And remember, this portion okay. this top half goes here, this bottom half goes over here. So the bank statement indicated a cash balance. So this is on the bank statement, so the bank balance has 5000 So you're going to write down uh, 5000 right there, so that's that number, okay? Uh, the cash ledger account has a balance of 4263 so that's that number right there, so 426283 So notice their difference, and again, most of these are simply timing differences. So what I'm going to do with each of these is ask myself, 
who hasn't yet recorded it? And when they do record it, what are they going to do with it? And when, so I'm going to put it on that side. So four outstanding checks totaled $717.75. You can list these out or you can just do the total. I tend to just do the total. But my question is, what is an outstanding check? An outstanding check is a check that um, I wrote it to a person and they haven't cashed it yet. And it hasn't got back to my bank yet. So my bank doesn't know it. So if um, you wrote me a check and I put it in my pocket for four or five days, um, it's, you've subtracted it in your books, but you, the bank hasn't got it yet, so there's no way they can know. So who has not recorded it? The bank has not recorded it. What are they going to do when they get it? They're going to subtract it. So I have the 717.75 over here. So it's right there. Okay, I'm going to put that there. A 410 deposit made after banking hours does not appear on the bank statement. Who has not recorded it? Um, the banks has not recorded it because it made it to does not appear on the bank statement. And what are they going to do tomorrow when they get it? They're going to add it. So I'm going to put that up here. So 41090. On July 30th, a bank returned an NSF check, not sufficient funds check for 50, received as payment of an accounts receivable. So what happened is when they, Mr. Ball or Mrs. Ball or whoever it is, uh, wrote me a check, I added it to my account and now I found out it's bad. So the banks subtracted it because they know it's bad. I don't know it's bad yet. So the books has not got it. And they're going to need it as a deduction. So deduct NSF check 5025. So I'm going to put that down there. Um, the bank statement showed 2470 of interest earned on the bank balance for the month of July. So notice this is on the bank statement, so the books has not recorded it. It's interest earned, not interest owed, interest earned. So I need to add it right there. So additions. So add interest, so 2474. Okay. Next one, the bank collected a five a non-interest bearing note on July 22nd for $500 and charged a $500 collection fee. So remember how I want to separate cash from record keeping from custody? Custody of cash from record keeping? Well, sometimes I can have people go pay at the bank and deposit an amount in my bank account. So notice the bank has the $500, but I don't know that yet. Now, Chances are the person who paid me will send me an email or send me a note that says, hey, I paid it. But sometimes if they do it on the first of the month every time, um, we just wait till we see it in the bank statement and we worry about it. If we don't get it, two days later, etc. So the bank's collected it for us. I don't know the exact date yet. When I get the bank statement, I see and I need to add it. So I'm going to add it right here. So I have my 500. Okay. Um, and a $5 collection fee. So they charged a $5 collection fee. Notice some people will want to do $4.95, but that's going to mess up your journal entry because the person paid us $500. So the notes receivable from that person is going to go down $500. So I deduct the collection fee down here, $5. Okay. Uh, check number 893 for telephone cleared the bank for $85, but was erroneously recorded on the books for $58. Okay, so when you have a um, when you have an error, errors are a little bit different than the other ones, but they should make common sense. Whoever made the error is the side that needs corrected. So it was erroneously recorded on our books. So I need to fig to fix the book side. The general ledger is our books, by the way. Hopefully, I already knew that from the prior chapter, but. Um, so the books made the error, and then I have to look at it to figure out whether I need to add it back or subtract more. It cleared the bank for 85, but I only recorded it as 58. So when I re this is a check I wrote. I deducted 58 in my book, and I should have deducted 85. So I need to deduct more to get the 58 up to 85. So 85 minus 58 is 27 dollars, and so I'm going to deduct it more. If this had flipped and I deducted it as 58, I'm sorry, recorded it as 85 and it should have been 58, I would need to add it back. Now, I would actually in this write something here. This is important, telephone expenses. I would put that on your um, thing because it's important. As far as the journal entries, 
um, what I need to do. Okay. Um, and then the bank charged a service charge of $12. Who has not reported it? The bank has recorded it, but the books have not. The bank charged it. So I don't know yet. And so I need to deduct it. So when I get it, which I got it right now, I need to put it under deductions. Okay, so make sure you have this. Then what happens is I'm going to total these up. And this is going to total up to 4,600, this number, 4,693.32. And this side is going to add up to 4,693.32. If you are wrong, you've probably either put something on the bank side that should be on the book side, or you deducted something you should have added. So a quick way to find those things is take your number, take your difference, divide it in half, and look for that number. So for instance, if I put this five dollars, notice goes here. If I put it up here instead of down here, I would have added five dollars instead of subtracted five dollars. So this side would be ten dollars difference because I added five instead of subtracting five. Or if I put it over here, I would have deducted five over here instead of deducting five over here. That difference is ten dollars. So. Just kind of look for it, but the important thing is knowing where it goes. So notice this is a pretty good multiple choice. Multiple choice A it would be you add it to the bank side. Multiple choice B would be you subtract it from the bank side. Multiple choice C would be you add it to the books. Multiple choice D would be you deduct it from the books. So make sure um, you practice those and know where those go. And again, it's, it's simple. But it does take some practice. Um, most of the people that miss it are just simply the ones that don't are too lazy to practice. So I'm sure that's none of you. So just practice several of them and you'll get it. Okay, so now remember the person who reconciles the bank account never, ever, ever is the person who is in charge of making the journal entries. Okay, now in your own personal statement, it's you. Why? Because if you steal from you, you steal from you, and you kind of know you stole from you, so it really doesn't make any difference, etc. But as far as the business goes, you do not want the person reconciling the bank account to make the journal entries. Um, a lot of fraud has taken place and theft has taken place when the person who wrote the journal entries also reconciled the bank account. So they could actually write checks to themselves. And so if they wrote a check to themselves when they checked the bank statement, oh, yep, that cleared, so that's good, and I don't have to worry about it. But if somebody else reconciles it, they'll see that um, a check was written to themselves. Or um, what some of the fraud cases has happened is, let's say you order supplies from a company, and you order supplies for a company for $4,000. So I'm going to debit supplies. Remember I said it's $4,000. I'm going to debit supplies and credit cash for $5,000. But remember I said the supplies was $4,000. Well, what happens is they wrote a check to the supply company for $4,000 and then wrote a check to themselves for $1,000. And so, but their cash balances. So you always have somebody different reconciling the bank account. Um, you can also find some errors they made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So since the person who makes journal entries does not reconcile the bank account, the general ledger in this case still says 426283. And these are all entries that I didn't know about but need to be made. Okay? So make sure you have these. Remember 524. Now I need to go back and make the journal entries only for the book side. The bank takes care of itself. I just need my final cash balance to be this. Right now it's sitting at that. So what happens is I generally make two journal entries, one for all the things I need to add to cash. So I add 524.74 and one for all the things I need to subtract from cash. So this is my debit to cash. It needs to go up. This is my credit to cash. It needs to go down. So that. Okay, so let's go to the uh, next journal entry. Okay, so notice I'm in a debit cash for 524.74, and then I need to ask myself where'd that cash come from? And that cash came from collection on a, a note and interest revenue. So hopefully you'll look at yours down there. Um, I'm not going to flip back and forth, but notice 
I interest earned, and I collected on a notes receivable. So I need to put those on my books. Debit cash, got the money from a notes receivable. That person no longer owes me money, and I earn some interest revenue. All right, and then the um, deductions from the account was this $5 collection fee, this not sufficient funds check, a service charge of 12, and an error. Remember, I had you write in there that the error was for telephone expense. Okay, so now I need to credit cash for $94.25. So I credit cash for $94.25. Before 25, I debit bank service charges. Um, you can do them separately if you want on your online homework. You can't, but in real life, you can debit bank service charge for five and debit bank service charge for 12 separately, but they added them together. Um, they put in the account receivable for AJ or for the ball account because they still owe them money, so they put it back into accounts receivable. And then they corrected the telephone expense error. So there's the journal entry that you have to make, et cetera. So now we're going to move on to short-term investments. Those are the required entries. Okay, so marketable securities, you can kind of read through what marketable securities are, but basically um, they are stock market securities. Okay, so we're going to go through these. Foster Company purchases short-term investments. So I'm going to, um, they paid $498, $4898, plus a brokerage commission of $80. So um, you're going to find out every cost to get the asset ready for its intended use is added to the cost of the asset. So I have 4,000 shares times $4898, and I add that $80. So I have 196,000. So I debit market security, credit cash for 196, and now you can see that each share technically costs $49 because I spread that $80 over all the shares. And so that becomes important when I sell them to know what they cost me. Okay, so make sure you do that. Then uh, what happens when they pay dividends? So dividends are income, so I debit cash for 4,000 times 30 cents and I credit dividend revenue. Again, practice these. Now, what happens when I sell the 500 shares? Uh, probably it's best to make a little T account here. And if you recall, okay, so I wrote up here 4,000 at 49. I can't run my mouse very good, but um, sometimes if you buy more shares, you just need to keep track of how many and what you bought them at. So notice I bought $49 because I spread them over this. Okay, so um, then when I sell them, I sold them for $50.04 less a $20 brokerage commission. So $50.04 times 500 shares um, is a number, and then I subtract that $20 brokerage commission because this is the cash they handed us. So they kept the fee um, and handed us the rest of the cash. Um, so. Basically, I got $25,000. I need to get the securities off my books for what I put them in there for. So I had 500 shares, and they're each there for 49. So if I was keeping track, I now have 3,500 shares at 49. Um, so that's 24.5. And then if you need a credit to balance, it's a gain. Gains are revenue, so revenues are credits. And if I needed a debit to balance, it's an expense. Um, so notice in this case, I need a debit to balance, so it's a loss. So you can go through the computations on this one. At year end, I have to mark them to market. So if you remember, I had, um, let me see how many I sold. I had 4,000, and then I sold um, 500, and then I sold 2,500. So now I have 1,000 shares in there at 49. All right, so now... Um, I have a current market value of 47,000. So I need to get my marketable securities down from 49 to 47. So they're an asset. So I get them down with a credit and I debit an unrealized holding loss. So notice this unrealized is important because a realized holding or a realized loss would be if I actually sold them. So if you 
contrast the unrealized tolling loss with this, this is a loss on the sale. This one, this unrealized holding loss, um, is kind of uh, not completely, you know, if, if the stock market fluctuates from day to day, you have unrealized holding gains or losses. Um, this usually um, appears on the stockholder's equity section of the balance sheet because it's an, a change in wealth, but it's not necessarily a change in market value. So there are different classifications of marketable securities. The ones classified as available for sale, um, this goes on the balance sheet in the stockholders' equity section. Okay, so you can see this. We've got marketable securities. They list the cost. They have the market value. And then I have an unrealized holding loss as part of owner's equity. So there you go. All of these entries were over here, so hopefully you uh, put them there. Um, so. Available for sale securities go with stockholders' equity. There's a trading securities that goes into net income, but I don't think this book covers that. Okay, so um, equity investments not traded on the stock exchange must be carried at cost, um, whereas international, um, we have all securities carried at market value. A lot of this is because it's pretty expensive to figure out the market value of a security that's not traded on the stock exchange. So think about um, having to have your business appraised every year if you had a small business with stock. Okay, accounts receivable. So now we're done with that. So now we're into accounts receivable. Um, accounts receivable are when you let somebody pay later. And so what I want you to know, this is going to be kind of... Uh, important that you write these things out. So I'm going to go through this first and then I'll kind of um, go through the PowerPoint slides. So I'm over here. There are two overall methods of accounting for bad debts. Those two overall methods are the allowance method. The allowance method is required by GAAP um, and I'm assuming you have read the chapter at this point in time so this is not completely new to you. And then the direct write-off method. The direct write-off method is not generally GAAP unless it's immaterial. So immaterial means it's too small to worry about. So if you have a business that usually sells on cash or credit card, the, about, the amount of accounts receivable they technically have would be very small. So if you think about your small shops around, even um, some of your big chain stores that would sell mainly to uh, the public, a little typo in there. Um, then you would have, could use the direct write-off method because you have so few accounts, sales on account, true account, not credit card is cash, remember. Okay, so within the allowance method, you will have two entries. The first entry is to set up the allowance. To set up the allowance is you debit uncollectible accounts expense and credit allowance for doubtful accounts. So if I would if it had a piece of paper, I would write down allowance method, and I would write down to set up the estimate, debit uncollectible accounts expense, debit the allowance. So notice what happens. Let me back up a second. Um, the matching principle says you have to match your revenue and the related expenses with the time period they pertain to. So in other words, when I record the sale, I need to record the related expenses. And those to go. I just can't ever see where it's going. And the related expenses are cost of goods sold. Okay? So that one's easy because if I sell an item for 15, I know that it cost 10 to buy. But some other related expenses of the sale are bad debt expense. Okay? Um, another related expenses are warranty. And there's, there's a few other, but these are the big ones. So here's the problem is at the time of the sale, I know how much the cost of good has sold because I've already purchased it. But I don't know how much is going to be bad debt expense right here or warranty expense. So there's only one way I can do it, and that is estimate. Um, and it's quite frankly a little scary how close companies can come in estimating their bad debts and warranty expense. But what they do is they take past years, um, 
they take past year's items and um, whatever they did in past year, they will do. This number right here is an estimate. Okay, so I'm going to estimate the amount of bad debts. So I do this entry only at the end of the year. Sometimes if I do it monthly, um, it's just I've taken my yearly estimate divided by 12, etc. But this book is going to simplify it. I do this entry at the end of the year. So in December of 2019, we're going to look at, you're going to find out later, sales or accounts receivable, and make my estimate based on those. I debit the estimate. So if you think financial statements are always 100% accurate, um, I think you've found out by now that that is not true. Okay, so now when I have um, debit and expense, I, I don't know whose accounts receivable it is. And accounts receivable all have subsidiary ledgers. So if you owed Quincy University some money, they would have student accounts receivable of a total, sorry, <coughs> of a total amount, and then they would have individual people's names with the balance. But I don't know how many are going to be bad or who, I do know how many, I'm guessing right here, but I don't know whose they are. So I put it in a holding account called the allowance. This entry, that account right there, the allowance for doubtful accounts, is a contra asset. Okay, I'm not gonna write that second. We'll do very well at that. Okay, so remember when I said accounts receivable is shown at net realizable value? That's because whenever you have accounts receivables, so let's say I loaned my uh, 100 people $10. So my accounts receivable has $1,000 in it. Okay? But I said accounts receivable has to be shown on the balance sheet at net realizable value. That's where the allowance comes in. Okay? So this is my allowance. I'll just stop there. Okay? And I said that two people won't pay me. So I have put $20 in the allowance. So I would debit uncollectible accounts expense for $20 and I would credit my allowance for 20. Okay? Notice the, these two together. So you will never see accounts receivable without the allowance. It's sort of like accumulated depreciation. You will never see a piece of equipment without its related accumulated depreciation. So I'm going to debit accounts receivable, credit my allowance for 20 bucks. Um, the net realizable value of this is 980. The 980 is what appears on the totals in my balance sheet. I might disclose these two numbers, but the 980 is what gets added up as far as an asset goes. Okay? All right, so this entry, make sure you know if you're setting up an estimate. So look for the words like estimates. I debit uncollectible accounts expense. The expense is always the estimate, and I debit the allowance. Okay? Now, when I find out whose it is, I don't need this temporary holding account anymore because I know the person's name who didn't pay me. So what indicates that somebody's not going to pay me while well, they file for bankruptcy, I can't get a hold of them, etc., etc. So now I can take it out of the allowance, so I debit the allowance, and let's say I found out one person, John Doe, isn't going to pay me, and then I credit accounts receivable to take it out of John Doe's specific account. Now, just because I take it out of accounts receivable doesn't mean I don't keep working on John Doe. In fact, the credit department, in essence, think of this. I take it out of accounting because he's no longer an asset. He's no longer a future or current benefit, and he's not going to pay. But I send it down to the credit department, and the credit department now works a whole lot more on him. So his account got really active in the credit department. It just got taken off my books because it's no longer an asset. So you um, credit the allowance for your estimate, and you, um, and you debit it the allowance for actual write-offs. Okay? So at year end, um, my allowance, so remember... I had put an estimate of 20 in here, okay, and I just wrote off 10, John Doe, okay, so now I have 10 left. Two things can happen. I'll either write off one more and I'll be perfectly correct, or I'll write off more, so let's say we had a bad economy and four people didn't pay me, so now I have 
$20 debit balance, or um, I still have $10 left, or I can have a zero. So with this, generally speaking, your allowance isn't going to zero out at the end. Your, your hope is that it gets pretty close to zero. All right. Um, what happens if somebody who wrote off later pays? And the answer is, if that happens, then this entry was wrong, so you flip it. So look at this. This should be over. I flip this entry, debit accounts receivable, credit the allowance, and then I show them collecting on the account. So again, practice these. That seems so obvious, and then I have tons of people miss this. Okay. Um, now, what the next thing I need to talk about is there are two ways to come up with this estimate right here. Remember, this is the estimate right there. Okay, there are two ways to come up with the estimate. One is based on the balance sheet approach where I look at accounts receivable and I am forcing my balance in the allowance. And the other one is, that's called the balance sheet approach because accounts receivable is a balance sheet account and the allowance without accounts is a balance sheet account. And the other one is the income statement approach where I look on sales. Sales is an income statement approach, but under this focus, I'm focusing on the expense. So you're gonna see how I compute these are a little bit different depending on whether I have the balance sheet or income statement approach. Okay, so. Okay, so we're talking about, you can read through the internal control over receivables. Incredibly important, just not <coughs> computational. Okay, so notice uh, on this one, I don't believe I have this one on there, but on the date the manager reviews accounts receivable and estimates approximately 10,000 of these accounts will prove to be uncollectible. So notice the word estimates. So whenever I estimate it, I debit uncollectible accounts expense and I credit allowance for doubtful accounts. So um, a couple of things, I tend to say bad debt expense and allowance for bad debts. I tend to write those only because fewer letters, quicker to write. But uncollectible accounts, doubtful accounts, bad debts, all of those are the same thing. Okay, so this is your journal entry. Uh, it's pretty important to note that this must be the first year they start business on January 1st. First. Most of the time, you wouldn't make this journal entry until December 31st. Uh, a month is too, too quick to estimate. Okay, we talked about the net realizable value, which is the balance in accounts receivable. In my case, it was 1,000, less the allowance, 20 bucks. So notice what gets added on the balance sheet is the net realizable value, even though that terminology isn't used. The net realizable value of 240 in this case. My, so they have people that owe me money, total of 250. I'm estimating I won't collect 10,000, and my net realizable realizable value is 240. Okay. Um, so now they have a write-off. So whenever you have a write-off, you debit the allowance. So your estimate credits the allowance. Your write-off debits the allowance. So now I know whose it is. It's discount stores. So I get their accounts receivable off my books and send it down to the credit department. Notice a write-off does not change the net realizable value. And the reason is, is because if you look at your journal entry, I'm getting this down, I'm reducing account allowance, and I'm also reducing accounts receivable. So the real, the biggest reason it doesn't affect the net realizable value is because I've already got this estimate here. The 10,000 includes the estimate. So now that I know whose it is, the, es the allowance for the estimate goes down, but so does accounts receivable. So I still have 240 because I've already allowed for that account to go back. <coughs> I just didn't know whose it was. Okay, so these are the two, the balance sheet approach, the income statement approach. Um, the balance sheet approach we do in we, again, we look at accounts receivable to determine how much goes in the allowance. So remember, accounts receivable is an asset, the allowance is an asset. Okay. Sometimes we do look at accounts receivable and we age them. Um, so this is this one. If you've ever gotten a hospital bill or a medical bill, they generally have the aging at the bottom. And every accounting software package will 
lets you enter the date of the sale and so they can tell you how long it's been past due. So notice the older the account gets, the bigger the chance it won't be collected. So notice over 90 days past due, it's 50%. I've seen some that go up to 180 or 270 and they'll say 100% and they actually, that's how they analyze the fact that I need to write it off. So at some point in time, if it's oversold, they will write it off. And that varies by industry because certainly a hospital or a medical company that has to do with insurance is going to have a longer write-off period. All right, so notice not really sure. Okay, uh, this is kind of important that you draw this, but notice on December 31st they have a total accounts receivable of 100,000, that's that number, of which 5,680 5, are estimated to be uncollectible. It's just based on my aging of 51,000 aren't even due, but 1% of them will end up to be bad, etc. And then over 90 days past due, we estimate 50%. Again, these estimates are based on past experience. So I have 5680 that I need to be. Okay. So this is my allowance. And I want this to be... This text thing doesn't work very well. I want that balance to be 5680. Okay. All right. Um, if the allowance currently has a credit balance of 4,000, so right now it has 4,000 in it. Okay. You only do this when you're doing the balance sheet method because the balance sheet method looks at accounts receivable to determine how much goes in the allowance. When you determine how much goes in the allowance, whatever happens to the balance or the bad debt expense happens to the bad debt expense and I don't care. Okay, so now what happens is what I need to get from 4000 to 5680 is to add the 1680. So your journal entry right here is this one, a debit uncollectible accounts expense. Remember, this is an estimate. These are estimates. There's no place in the world that this would be an actual. You have people's names when they're actual. You have bankruptcy notices. <clears throat> so I would debit uncollectible accounts expense and credit the allowance. Sometimes you can have a debit balance in it. So let's say that this was a debit balance of 4000 instead of a credit balance of 4000 Well, I need to get from in a debit side of 4000 to credit side of 5680 so my entry would be 9680 to go from 4000 in the hole to 5680 out of the hole okay so why do you you do consider the prior balance because i want the allowance balance to be 5680 and it's a balance sheet account Okay, the income statement approach looks at sales to determine how much goes into bad debt expense. So, note bad debt expense is an income statement account. Income statement accounts are zeroed out at year end. So, if when I'm determining how much I want into bad debt expense, I'm usually starting out with a zero number. So, we have... Two percent of credit sales will be uncollectible, so I take two percent of my hundred and fifty thousand. That's three thousand. So I've determined I want this to be three thousand. Notice that I have zero in it already, so I add three thousand. So notice I debited bad debt expense or uncollectible accounts expense and credit the allowance. Um, what happens to my allowance if it had four thousand in it? So if my allowance already had 4,000 in it, I've added 3,000 to it, so now it has 7,000. Okay, so don't forget that your journal entry to the allowance, you don't necessarily care about the balance, what's in your allowance, as far as the journal entry, but your allowance still goes up because you made a journal entry to it. All right. Um,
Okay, um, what happens if you collect on an account previously written off? Well, you just flip the journal entry. Um, I talked about that up here. Okay, you flip the this journal entry, and then you show you collected the cash. Okay, the direct write-off method, if you think about it, I'm going to go back up here a second. If you think about it, here's my two journal entries if I have the allowance. One to set up the estimate and one to um, write off the account. Well, if I'm not going to have an estimate and I'm not going to have an allowance, I don't need that account and I don't have an allowance. So look what happens is you just debit uncollectible accounts expense and credit accounts receivable. The why this is problematic um, is because sometimes this write-off happens in a year subsequent to the sale. So remember, the matching principle says I have to record the related expenses in the same time period as I have the sale, but if I sold this in December, the chances of this going bad in the same year are slim to none, so I have to make estimates for it. But the, bad, uh, the direct write-off method is used for tax purposes, and um, you can use it if you don't have much bad debts because it's immaterial. But notice, I just don't have an allowance, so I kind of get rid of my allowances and sandwich these two together. And this journal entry is made when the account goes bad. And you can read this. Factoring accounts receivable. Factoring is when basically they sell an accounts receivable to a financial institution. This entry is not on factoring, by the way, it's on a different one. So just know what it is. It's when you sell it to a financial institution to get cash. So if you have $10,000 of accounts receivable and you want to sell them, um, obviously they're not going to pay you all $10,000 for them because they're taking on some risk. So they're going to pay you a little or somewhat less than 10000 depending on how strong your accounts receivable are, and they hope to collect more than they paid for them and make money off of it. That's factory. Okay, uh, credit card sales. We've talked about this, that uh, credit card sales, the Visa and MasterCard charge the business a servicing fee. Um, and so you record them as cash because Visa and MasterCard take the risk of you not paying. Notes receivable, there's some um, definitions on notes receivable. You can read through those. Um, but basically, when I have a notes receivable, um, I'll earn some money on it. So just make sure you don't get notes receivable and notes payable confused. Okay, so on December 30. On December 1st, so three months, so notice is going to split a year end. I'm going to actually draw this here. So I've got December 1st, and then I have December 31st. So I have one month here and two months here. Okay, so they're going to pay it back here. So the notes receivable is acquired from customer Marvin White for $60,000. So I debit a notes receivable. Notice it's in settlement of an existing accounts receivable. So what happened is this person didn't pay off their account, so you got him to sign a note. So other times it will be cash if they lend him cash, but um, I got it in settlement of accounts receivable. So I have $60,000, and then uh, the matching principle says I have to record the interest in the period it's earned. So on December 31st, I've earned one month of interest, so the formula for interest is principal. $60,000 times rate, 0.06, times time, 1 12th, because the interest rate, according to federal law, like truth in lending laws, interest rate has to be stated on an annual basis. So I take one month of three, $300 here, and then you're going to find out later on when we get two months later, so February 28th, you're going to record another $600 of interest and revenue, then I'm going to collect both the note and the interest revenue on that. Okay, so this is the entry when I collect on it. So I got $60,900. I get the notes receivable off my books for $600. I get the interest receivable off my books for 300 
and I record that other two months of interest. So this one is done on March 1st. I said February 28th. Um, but anyway, so there's your journal entry. What happens if they default on it? Well, I still have earned the interest and the revenue, but I need to stick it back in accounts receivable. So now this person has uh, 60,900 of accounts receivable because they legally own me the interest. Okay, so now um, some ratios. Some ratios is you have accounts receivable turnover that basically says on average, how many times do you sell and collect your accounts receivable a year? Um, so that's just basically your ratio. It's your average sales divided by average accounts receivable. Accounts receivable, notice this says average. If this said ending balance of accounts receivable, I'd have to average them. And how do I, how do I average them? So for 2018, December 31st, 2017 is the same as January 1st, 2018. So I'd take these two numbers right there on average so beginning of the year plus end of the year divided by two for 2017 i'd take beginning of the year plus end of the year divided by two for 2016 i'd take this plus that divided by two and i couldn't do 2015 because so i don't have 2014. so basically sales divided by average accounts receivable um, can tell you how many times you sell and collect a year and then the the number of days um, I take my number of days in a year, I'm divided by the ratio that I just got in the prior uh, ratio. So, um, it doesn't work. Okay, so I would take 17,000 divided by 1,700, and I would get my second I don't use my calculators, the second I will uh, mess up my tens, but even though it only has one there. So the, my accounts receivable turnover is 10 times a year, and then I would do this next one, days in a year, so 365 divided by 10. Um, some companies use 360, it doesn't matter, but 36.5 days. So on average, I collect every 36.5 days. And we're done.